So let's suppose we have a rigid two-dimensional box as shown in the following diagram. So we have the right wall of the box and the left wall of the box and these walls basically extend upward to infinity. Now the right wall of the box lies along the y-axis and the bottom side of the box lies along the horizontal x-axis. Now because the left wall of the box coincides with the y-axis, the left corner of the box is at a position of x equals zero. On the other hand, let's suppose the right corner of the box lies at a position along the x-axis where x is equal to L. So that basically means the distance between our two corners of the box is given by L. So let's suppose we take a particle of mass m, for example an electron, and we allow that electron to only move along the bottom side of our box between these two corners of the box. Now when the electron, when the particle collides with either one of these two walls of the box, a perfectly elastic collision takes place. That basically means energy as well as momentum is conserved. So, once again, let's consider a particle of mass m confined to a one-dimensional rigid box with length l. So, one dimension simply means our particle is moving along the bottom side of our two-dimensional rigid box. Now, as mentioned, the particle can move along the width of our box and the collisions between the two walls are perfectly elastic. Now, this type of box, this type of situation is commonly known as the infinitely deep square well potential or simply a rigid box. So this type of situation is known as a particle moving inside a rigid box. Now, for this particular situation, let's suppose that our potential of our moving particle is equal to zero when our particle is found between these two corners of our box. So zero is less than x, which is less than l. Now, on the other hand, if our particle is found at either one of these two corners or anywhere beyond our two corners, our potential energy with respect to x, which is the y-axis, basically jumps all the way to infinity. Now, the question that we want to explore in this lecture is basically the following. What exactly is the behavior and the motion of our particle as it moves between these two corners of our box? So we want to explore the motion of our particle when our particle is under this condition. So, once again, what is the motion of the particle as it travels along the width of the bottom of our rigid box when our x is greater than 0 or less than L and less than L? Now, basically, to determine the motion of any subatomic particle, for example, our electron, we must determine the wave function. And to determine the wave function, we, we have to use Schrodinger's equation. Now, notice that as our particle moves along the bottom part of our rigid box, the potential energy is equal to zero, and that basically means the particle does not feel any force, and that means the particle is in fact a free particle. Now, in our lecture, on our discussion on free particles, we said that the solution to Schrodinger's equation for free particles is given by this formula. So the wave function that depends on x for any free particle with a potential energy of zero is equal to a multiplied by sine of kx plus b multiplied by cosine of, of kx. So this is only true for all free particles that have a potential energy of zero.
So basically, to determine the behavior and motion of our free particle inside the one-dimensional rigid box, we have to use this equation. So this means we must determine what the constants A and B are, as well as find the constraints on K, where K is equal to the square root of 2 multiplied by M, multiplied by e divided by h bar squared and because k depends on the energy that basically means we have to find what the constraints are what the requirements are for our energy of this particle moving along our rigid box so basically even though the potential energy is zero this object because it is in fact moving must have some sort of finite amount of kinetic energy. So the total amount of energy that our particle has as it moves must be a finite value. Now, before we begin, let's actually determine what the boundary conditions of our problem is. So by the boundary condition, we simply mean what the wave function value is when our particle is found at the corners of our rigid box. So we must find, we must determine what our wave function is when x equals 0 and when x equals L. Now, although we don't really know what our wave function is, we, we do know what the potential energy is of our particle when x is equal to 0 and x is equal to L. So at these x values, the potential energy u of 0 and u of L is equal to infinite, in infinity. So that means the energy of our particle at the corners of our two of our box is equal to infinity. Now this basically implies from the Schrodinger equation that if u of x is equal to infinity, this quantity must be equal to zero. So the wave function at zero is equal to the wave function at L, which is equal to zero. So if this was not true, then the product of u x and uh, psi of x would be some infinite value. And that basically means that the Schrodinger equation would be infinitely large, which implies that the energy, the kinetic energy of our object would also be infinitely large. And of course, that is not true. We begin by assuming that our particle has a finite amount of kinetic energy. So once again, from Schrodinger's equation, because our energy is equal to infinity at the two corners of our box, that means that the wave function at the two corners of the box is equal to zero. Now, so knowing this, let's begin by calculating what our constant B is. So we want to find what the value of the constant B is. So let's begin by assuming that x is equal to zero. So we're going to use this condition to find what b is. Now, if x is equal to zero, we know from this discussion that the wave function at the left corner of our box is equal to zero. That basically means the particle cannot be found at that position. Now, if this is in fact true, then that implies from this equation that psi of 0 is equal to a multiplied by sine of 0 plus b multiplied by cosine of 0. Now because sine of 0 is 0 and cosine of 0 is 1, we see that psi of 0 is equal to 0 plus b multiplied by 1 which is equal to 0. And the only time this is actually true is if b is equal to 0. So we basically see from this discussion that the b value in the following equation has to be equal to 0. So now we know what b is. So now let's determine what the requirements are for the k. So what are the constraints for k?
So, since we know that b is equal to zero from this discussion, that basically means that the wave function at x is equal to a multiplied by sine of kx plus b multiplied by cosine of kx. And because b is equal to zero, this goes to zero. So, our wave function becomes as follows. So, psi of x is equal to a multiplied by sine of kx. Now, if we let our x equal to zero, now if we suppose that the particle is found at the right corner of the box, that basically means from this discussion that psi of L is equal to A multiplied by sine of KL, which is equal to zero. Now, the only time A multiplied by sine of KL is equal to zero is when A is equal to zero or sine of KL is equal to zero or both are equal to zero. So basically, can A be zero? Now, if A is equal to zero, that basically means that the wave function of x at any position is always equal to zero. Now, if the wave function is always equal to zero, then the square of the wave function is always equal to zero. And since the square of the function gives us the probability of finding our electron, and if the probability is zero, that means the electron doesn't actually exist, the particle doesn't exist exist, which is a contradiction to our initial assumption. We assume that there is in fact a particle with mass m confined to the one-dimensional rigid box. So this basically means that since we began our assumption that particle does in fact exist, a cannot equal to zero, and that means that sine of kl must equal to zero. So, if A cannot be zero, and this product is equal to zero, then that means that sine of this quantity must equal to zero. Now, this is only true if the inside of the sine function, so if K multiplied by L is equal to zero, pi, two pi, three pi, four pi, and so on. So, this basically implies that K multiplied by L, the inside of the sine function is equal to n multiplied by pi, where n is a value 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 or 5 or, and so on. So basically, we neglect n equals 0 because if n equals 0, that means our wave function is also equal to 0, is always equal to 0. So we neglect n equals 0, and n must equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. Now, if we rearrange this equation and solve for k, we see that k is equal to n multiplied by pi divided by l, where once again n is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Now, if we continue on the left side of the board, recall that since k is equal to the square root of 2me divided by h bar squared, we can basically replace the k with n pi divided by l, as we do in the following section. Now, if we solve for our e, the energy of our particle in the rigid box, and we replace h bar with h divided by 2 pi, we get the following result. So the energy e of our particle inside the one-dimensional rigid box is equal to n squared multiplied by h squared, where h is Planck's constant, divided by 8 multiplied by m, where m is the mass of the particle, multiplied by l squared, where l is the width of that one-dimensional rigid box, and n is simply a positive integer. So, what exactly does this equation actually tell us? Well, it tells us that a particle trapped inside a one-dimensional rigid box 
has a quantized amount of energy. So basically, this is in accordance with quantum theory of energy. Now, notice that this positive N value is known as the quantum number. And we define zero potential energy as the lowest possible energy that our confined particle could have. And this represents a value of N equals 1. So notice an important byproduct of this discussion. Even if our particle has the lowest amount of energy, when our N is equal to 1, that particle is still moving along that one dimension of that rigid box. So that basically means, even if the absolute temperature is at 0 kelvins, our particle, based on quantum mechanics, is still moving with some energy given by E1, so it still has some velocity. Now, the last question that we want to ask is the following. So we found what B is and we also just discussed what the constraints are for our K value as well as the energy. So now all is left is to find what the A is. So from this discussion, we see that our wave function with respect to x is equal to a multiplied by sine of n pi divided by L multiplied by k, multiplied by x, where the k has been replaced with this equation, where n is the quantum number of our confined particle. So, how exactly are we going to solve for A? Now, recall in our discussion on the constraints for wave function and normalization, we said that for a wave function to actually be physically meaningful and physically measurable, that wave function has to be normalized. And that basically means the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of the square of the absolute value of the wave function with respect to dx must equal to zero. Now if we replace this with the following equation, this is equal to the integral from zero to L from the left corner of the box to the right corner of the box multiplied by a squared times sine squared of n pi divided by L times x of dx and this is equal to 1 by the concept of normalization. Now if we actually integrate this, we'll get the following result. So the left side is a squared multiplied by L divided by 2 and the right side is equal to 0. Now if we multiply both sides by 2 and we divide by L and take the square root, we get that A is equal to the square root of 2 divided by L, where L is simply our length of that box. It's the width of that box. So what exactly is the meaning of A? So A represents the amplitude of the wave function, the wave that is produced by our particle as it moves within the confined one dimension rigid box. So we see as our L increases, as the width of the box increases, this quantity decreases and the amplitude decreases. So as the width decreases, uh, as the width increases, our amplitude will decrease. And likewise, as our width decreases, the amplitude of the wave will increase. 